Hey, everybody. How's it going? Great to see all your friendly faces. Terry, I see you in there. Kevin, I don't believe we have ever met before, but hello. Nima, great to see you. Who else is in here? I see Mark's here. Jody's here. Robbie's hiding out. We are going to get started. So welcome to Real Estate Wealth Lab. We have a fun event for you today with lots packed full of information. Um, the, um, you know, uh, as people are joining us, I want to take a moment and uh, I, I came to this realization. I actually went, uh, I, all of us on this call, on the, at, at least on the leadership level, we are real estate investors. And as real estate investors, we, we struggle with trying to figure out how to invest in today's market. And by struggle, I really do mean that it is a bit of a, a chaotic market. Like it's, it's not simple uh, anymore. It used to be simple three years ago, four years ago, or it felt simpler, uh, you know. But what we've got in the Real Estate Wealth Lab is one, we have uh, not just great members and we have great leadership, but we also have a website that I think is one of the most underused um, toolbox that you have access to as members. I actually want to share something here for a minute. I'm going to share my screen. And the, my team does not know I'm doing this. So this is totally off the cuff. But as I saw all your all you coming in, I thought, you know what, I'm going to go on to the Real Estate Wealth Lab. If you go onto our website and you click on uh, Real Estate Wealth Lab, the next in, uh, Real Estate Intelligence Report, what you will find is a whole group of reports that look like this. Um, I trust that you can see this. It, 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 and we have tons of all different playbooks, um, things there to help you. And under that, if you click on Real Estate Intelligence Report, you will have every week an intelligence report that comes out that that gives you articles on what is going on in the real estate world in real time now i was on it for february 15th and um here's what i what i found out okay we've got one article here and i you can you see my um page somebody yell out yes for me because yeah we can see it out. all right perfect Thank you. Let me go back. Now, what's happening in Canada? February um, 7th, here's an article. And the gist of it, the summary of it, is that Canada's economy is currently weak and the finance com community is expecting low economic growth. Uh, that th The economy is weak. Now, you go down on our intelligence report to Ontario, uh, sorry, into just a little bit lower than that. And where is that? Here we go. February 10th, a couple days later, Canada's economy has a strong showing in Canada, adding 150,000 jobs with more than 120,000 of them being full-time positions. Within the matter a scope of two days, there are two articles one telling you that the world is coming to an end, the other one telling you, hey, we are exceeding even our predictions. So what is it? And I think in an environment of conflicting information like that, it becomes difficult to see the future. What we have in our community is we have a group of investors as members, as, as people that are uh, involved in this community, we are all investing in real estate in real time. And as a result, what you have in this group is a way of seeing the world around us through the struggle. I can't tell you what the future is going to look like. I can only tell you that every day I have conversations with investors who are all struggling to see clearly what the future is going to look like. And so because of that, the strength there is in the community. So I'll, I'll tell you, I've had... Even today, like every day I have a conversation with somebody calling me, telling me what's going on. How, how, do, I, how do I predict the, the future? Here's the approach that I take. I go to the intelligence report. I read it. I talk to other investors. I read other articles. 
once I've read everything that that I can that I've got the time to read because you don't have the time to assimilate all the information. Once you've read it, I then go away and leave it alone for about 24 hours. I just leave it in the back of my mind. Then what I do is I come back to the problem I'm trying to solve and I ask myself a question. I ask myself this question. What does it mean that I've read this? And here's the magic question. What do I believe will happen with the real estate market in the next three years? And my belief often is an assimilation of the information I've taken in and how I've thought about it. And then given what I believe, I then create my response to the market. So my, if you are among us and you are thinking that, man, this is a complicated market, it's difficult to understand what is going on. What I would suggest is one thing that you can do is just once you've assimilated all the information, ask yourself, what do you believe? And then make the best choice possible. Mm -hmm. Because if you wait for everybody else to uh, show you which road to go or which pathway to take, you'll feel very confused. And it removes the decision-making power from you. Anyway, hey, that's just me riffing. Welcome everybody to the Real Estate Wealth Lab. Um, Vincent, can you throw up the slide deck for me? We, we've got a few housekeeping things to get through real quick, and then we are going to jump right into it. Um, so my name is Narayan Kulathungam. I am the Chief Leadership Officer. Today hosting you out of our leadership is Vincent Sundar and Louis Leno. Louis, you're going to have to I hope I got your last name right. I know my last name is Kula Thungam and it gets butchered all the time. Okay. We're good. No problem, We're good. Perfect. Uh, next slide, please, Vincent. So, uh, and today we have a special guest. We have Tara Flynn. There are two things that we are going to be looking at today in our, in our meeting. One, Lewis is going to be presenting about construction and budgets, and there will be a magic that you will, you're going to encounter when he and I have a conversation about construction because he is a heavyweight uh, in this room and in, in Canada. Secondly, we have Tara Flynn. She is the number one agent in Leduc, and we were thinking there's a number of us that invest in Alberta. I personally do not invest in Alberta just because it's just not in my wheelhouse, but I am like many of you. I know I'm very, very curious about Alberta and I'm itching to invest there and I need to know more. So we brought in the, 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 the King Kong of Leduc herself. She, she knows her stuff and she has a great heart. Tara, from the time I've known you, you've had a great heart, not just for real estate and investing, but for investors, for people. Uh, you're one of the, you the way I've always experienced you is that not only do you know your stuff, not only are you good at what you do, but you have my back. And that's important to me as an investor to have an agent or somebody in my corner that has my back. Let's move on to the next slide, uh, Vincent. So this is a legal disclaimer. It means that we, uh, does, we are not providing you investment advice. We are all investors here. If you want to take a screenshot of that, you can but you need to do your own due diligence before executing on your decisions. Now, on the next slide, you're going to find that uh, we do want you to ask questions, say hi in the chat, uh, share feedback, you know, be courteous. The only thing we ask is don't solicit, don't sell. Don't come in, this is, this is our room. Don't come in here and uh, solicit and sell. And judging by all of you, I don't think that's going to be an issue. On the next slide, you're going to find out that if you need help, um, this is how you can take a screenshot of this. Ken is away today. I, he may be catching us as he's driving, mm -hmm. but um, uh, the, this is uh, five of our uh, larger team. Uh, that, and if you ever need help, just reach out to us. We're here. We provide mentorship coaching as well on top of uh, everything else. Um, I believe that this uh, event is being recorded. So if you are a rule member, I think on the next slide, Vincent, it will tell you that um, uh, that uh, it, it we are we are being recorded, um, Vincent. I'm going to ask you to stop sharing. Thank you. You're going to come back in, Vincent. Is that right? With Tara in a few minutes. Absolutely. Can't wait for All that. Right. So before we get to uh, Vincent and Tara, Lewis, 
you and I are going to have a chat and you are going to be presenting and talking to us about uh, construction stuff. Now, yeah. is that right? Now, now, now Correct. Goes, so uh, I'm going to kind of, we're going to spend about uh, 25 minutes or 20 minutes talking about this. Okay. Uh, the the one thing that I, that I want to right out of the gate, just kind of highlight and underline for those of you in our in our call or if you're catching the recording as many of you do yeah is that lewis is a heavyweight in the construction industry now, lewis the the um the the way you show up often is that you do not show up as being braggy you don't uh, you know uh, put yourself up. You're constantly trying to elevate everybody else around you. And I think that as a result of that, sometimes your greatness isn't highlighted well enough. So I am going to do something that uh, you're not going to like, uh -oh. but I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> All right. I want to, I'm going to drag you into a conversation for about a, two minutes. Can you give us an idea of what type of construction you have done. I believe you told me, okay, hold on. You know, when I first started in real estate investing, the very first property I bought, I spent $15,000 in renovating and I was nervous about it. Since then, obviously I've done way, way bigger projects, but nothing close to you. I believe you have totaled, you have not over, like, like, you know, most of us would go, well, we have a few million dollars that we've spent in construction. One million, two million, ten million. I believe Lewis has reached the B word. I believe he has he, he has done a billion or over a billion dollars in construction. This this year will be just over a billion. That is crazy. Now, collectively, I don't listen. I don't have a billion in the bank, but on all the projects I've, I've been on and the experience that I've gained and in collaboration with all the properties and, and personal projects I've worked on, it, it uh, amasses so, to just over a billion. So, so here's what that means. That means that we have somebody on not just in our room right here in our community that has the experience that $1 billion of education will buy him. Good way to put it. Right? That's what it means. So, Lewis, I'm really, really excited about our conversation today. So, you take it away. You lead it. And I want to sit and chat with you about this. Tell, tell, first of all, give me an idea. Like, were you born? Were you born with a hammer in your hand? Like, how did you end up here? At Naran, you read my mind. That's an incredible segue because I just wanted to share quickly. I have many stories to share, but the first one that resonates off of what you just said the first project I ever did was I helped my father in a renovation in a family home. We were in downtown Toronto in the East End in the, oh gosh, the beaches. And I was in, in and around preschool. I can barely remember those years. But the co contribution to the project that my father was working on, I actually took his tools and I would sell them to the neighborhood kids. <laughs> well... <laughs> <laughs> well, he was out at work. So that was my first project. I, well, you I, probably, were that guy. I cost the project more than it should have. Um, but uh, that's how I that's how I got my start. It was literally um, my father renovating homes. He was active in the real estate market as well in Toronto. And uh, that's, you know, I have, uh, I guess you can call it humble beginnings of <laughs> getting getting going from the ground up. But listen, today, I want to share a whole bunch of good stuff. Uh, in relation to the market we're all experiencing now with uh, interest and inflation that we were well aware of for the last year or two. Um, just want to share some budget saving strategies that I think we can all implement on different projects, regardless of whether it's a bathroom renovation, uh, renovating a whole single family dwelling, a duplex, a multifamily, or if you're on a larger project where there's a, a tremendous amount of due diligence and, and pre-construction required, for say multifamily or construction, uh, sorry, commercial construction, then uh, these tips will definitely help you 
get off to a good start, whether you're in pre-construction, construction, or even finishing off the project or haven't even started it yet. So, so glad you're doing that, Lewis, because um, that is where I see a lot of people going off the deep end, where they lose control of the budget in some form or fashion. Now, I just want to structure something here for you. Tell me the type, of, before you get into that, tell me the type of projects that you have worked on. Just list them, like different kinds. I started in residential, a lot of residential, predominantly single family dwellings, um, condo buildings, and some low rise multifamily. And as I progress my career, I've completed uh, hospital work, hotel work, train stations, uh, nuclear facilities, all types of commercial and ICI uh, projects like that. So a quite quite a expansive range of, um, of, of projects that I've been involved on and different types of asset classes within the real estate uh, space. So I believe you worked on Union Station in Toronto? Yes, that was the train station. So that was that was being the entire train station, Union Station. If anyone's familiar with the building in downtown Toronto there, I know many cities have a Union Station, but the one in Toronto, we underpinned it and added two floors below the train station. So that was the project still going on. It started pre-engineering started in about 2006, give or take. And the project is still going on to this day. They're on their, I don't know, I don't know what phase they're on, but um, it's, it's a very complex undertaking. And I was there for just over two years working with, uh, with go transit and Metro links and uh, via rail down there so very exciting so from that to nuclear and you want to you want to, so we get to hear from you about budgeting given that you've handled massive budgets yeah and the the big trust me the bigger the project the the uglier it gets all right keep going before i interrupt you again <laughs> so these these were in no particular order um really just rhyme them off the top of my head based on a lot of experience and a lot of, you know, trial and error myself along with uh, different project teams that I've been working with. So the first one is, and again, they may sound simple, but they, they are very impactful. So get a pen and a paper and write these down. And if maybe if we have enough comment and Q&A at the end, maybe Rule will send out an email posting these top 10 so everyone can get a complete list of them if anyone's interested. So number one, when you start, be prepared to continue through to completion. Do not stop the project. Uh, this can have many ramifications. Again, depending on the size of the project, whether if it's a small bathroom renovation in a rental property, or if you're redeveloping six multifamily units, you wanna make sure that when you get those permit drawings and you're starting that construction project, you have things planned and in place to see it through to completion you don't wanna have a lot of unknown variables. Um, definitely difficult to control at times, but control everything that you can. Get all your material prepared. Um, hire and at least get under contract um, a majority of your contractors or subcontractors if you're not using a general contractor, especially the ones that are gonna start the project for you, say any structural work, framing, mechanical, your drywall. When you start a project, you wanna at least have up to the drywall stage awarded to sub trades. The tiling and the paint may be down the road, so you might be able to leave those for a little bit. But if you have, especially in this environment, if you have all of your trades lined up and people know you're gonna execute, and even if you wanna, what you wanna do is maybe even give out a letter of intent to let them know you're serious that you're moving forward with this project, because not a lot of people go to that effort and uh, practice that professionalism by providing sub trades with uh, letters of intent. That's a big one. That that's It's a professional move and it'll show them that you're serious, that you're going to move forward with this project and even give them like a rough timeline so they can anticipate when you're going to need them and they'll be able to put it in their schedule and, and their pipeline of activity because they're not sitting around waiting for you. The trades are very busy these days. Um, number two, go in, it kind of lends itself from number one, but go in sequence of procurement. You can even apply this to the pre-construction. Before you start dealing with any trades, 
on, on some larger projects, there's going to be a series of events that needs to happen. Uh, are you buying a property that you don't own yet? Are there any um, appraisals required? Uh, does the underwriter or the financial broker require a um, cost analysis on, on a bigger multifamily deal? If the renovation is that extensive and you're looking for a construction loan, then typically the underwriter is going to want, definitely going to want an appraisal, but also a construction analysis on, on the cost and what it's going to be because they're going to use that to, um, to pull the percentage draws off of during the different phases and uh, cycles of construction you go through. Um, number three, again, regarding the subtrades, negotiate with them and build relationships with them. Uh, in particular, in high, high interest and inflationary times, it's, it can be a volatile market in the residential sector for trades and subtrades. So you're going to want to leverage your relationships that you already have. If you're looking for new partners or subtrades, then speak to them honestly and transparently. Let them know the type of project that you have on hand, uh, when you think you're going to need them, and speak to them with, with information that's going to solidify uh, a relationship like everything they need to know. You have the material selected. Are you just going to a tile setter and asking them for a price, but you don't know what you want to install? That is the kiss of death. The trade will turn around and walk away because there's so many different tiles to install, for example, or shingles for that matter. If you don't know what material you need to install, having someone furnish you with a price is next to a waste of their time and they're not going to take you seriously. So as the client or the owner of a pro property or project, you need to be, you need to present yourself as a professional vendor or client to these sub trades so they can take you that much more seriously because that's a big problem in the industry with sub trades speaking to different clients is if you elevate yourself and, and speak from a place of authority and know what you're talking about as far as what you want and your expectations, then you're, you're going to be far better off with, uh, with the sub trades and getting a result from them. So far, so good. Naran, any questions? Yeah, I just want to, I am just really, really impressed with your insistence on being professional. Professional. It makes a difference. Uh, it, it does make a huge difference. And, uh, you know, when you, when you talk about not approaching, uh, say, a tile installer until you've got the tile chosen out, uh, for those of us who are, who are starting in the investment, in the renovation uh, world, there will be a tendency for us to put off making decisions on finishes until later. And I've found that, Louis, correct me if I'm wrong from your experience, but from, from my experience, I found that to be the kiss of death. I like to have even the finishes chosen because then I can clearly um, uh, even talk about this is the tile that is going up. It's yeah. this type of tile. This is the type of backing it needs. Um, then it's really, really clear. The other thing is that the, the letter of intent is a phenomenal idea. I have never done that with, um, with uh, my trades. And I just made a note to incorporate that into my process because I do that with joint venture partners. But right. I never trade. That will just elevate my game. It, it's almost like, you know, the only paper we hand sub trades is a check. But if you give them that letter of intent, it's, it's a almost as good as a check. So you're already handing them something of value before the project's even started. They're gonna keep you on the top of their list. Absolutely. Right. Thank you. No problem. Um, so next one, uh, interest eats profit. So this kind of lends itself to the first one of when you start a project, don't stop it. If you have any type of construction loan or financing in place to help you subsidize the renovation, you have to consider that the more decisions you have to make during the construction process, the more time you're going to waste. And that's going to eat at your profits because you're going to continue to extend the schedule lifeline. Um, and, you know, Naran, like you said, picking the finishes beforehand is a great idea because during the construction process, I'm sh anyone that's done any size project, 
you plan it, you start it, you cut the ribbon. And then what happens? You get a bunch of problems that you don't expect. So if you can take care of the items you can control before the project starts, you're leaving yourself with maximum bandwidth to deal with the fires that are going to happen literally and figuratively. So keep, keep that in mind. Um, another one that I put down here that is, is of consequence, material systems. So if, if you're newer to the construction game and not familiar with too many different types of material systems, speak to the sub trades and even manufacturers or sales reps about how it's installed, what's required. Go ahead, Naran. So Lewis, let me just pause for a minute. The, what do you mean by material system? So a fl flooring, for example, you can have a uh, glue down, nail down, floating, double glued, double backed. It can come, it can be installed in many different ways. So understanding the installation procedure, um, some of them can be a lot more costly than others. Some may not be uh, suitable for particular substrates like uh, concrete flooring or subfloor. So you want to kind of get some of this knowledge, again, in partnership with your sub trades that you have at least started the conversation with. So they can help you, guide you in a way that uh, can be cost effective for the project and not take, you know, the floor is not going to take an extra four weeks because there's three different layers to go down as opposed to picking one, uh, another particular material that might cost an extra dollar a square foot, but save you four weeks in schedule time. Right? right. So different material systems like that. Tile is another one. Some tiles need to be sealed and, and cured before you can even install them on the wall. If you're in a crunch, you got to pick a tile that you can slap up there and grout it and forget about it. Right. So different, different things like this. So in particular, when it comes to the finishing, speak to the sub trade. And if you don't have the type of tile you want yet, let them know the type of project, if it's a rental or a personal residence or whatever the case or a flip, and they can at least advise you on what would be the most cost effective and uh, you know time friendly installation, so to speak. That is so crucial. And Lewis, even when it comes to material systems, one of the questions that I've kind of trained myself to ask is if this is the system or material and the, the process that I'm using to install this material, I then ask myself this question, what does this mean? Yeah. And it, because sometimes I just go, oh, like, like real life example right now, um, I have a fireplace that I've installed and there's a, a, a stone slab that has gone on top, but the slab can't get cut out because I didn't ask the question, what does it mean to cut out the slab? It right. means that I have to have a trim kit for that fireplace and I never ordered the trim kit. Well, that slowed my job down by two weeks because now I've got to order the trim kit and I've got to wait for it. Yeah, and you, you don't have a template to cut out because you don't have the trim kit. Exactly. Yeah, that's a big right. one. But you think those two things would be sold together, but they're sold separately. Like, uh, yeah. Yes, yeah. I, I was at a plumbing store today because we've done a whole house and all the, all the plumbing is there, but the pop-up drain doesn't come with the, the tap or the sink. It's a second, third order. And we totally yes. missed it. Right? Yes. Now, and, now ordered it. and just a side note, if you like ordering a lot of stuff on Amazon or Home Depot online, they've started a trend where they're selling parts separately. So you, they might show you a picture of the valve, the finished trim, and some other accessories for, for adding additional valves. And it might show you a price and all the pictures, but you're actually maybe just buying the valve body itself and you have to buy the trim separately. But I've had many projects in the past where people's, yeah, I got everything in the garage. You get to the garage and you see a box and you're ready to install everything. And it's a half of the project is there. So be careful if you're ordering online. Again, speak to the sub trade and, and they can have very competitive deals with their suppliers and they know what they're getting. So if you're not too familiar with it, maybe put the onus on the subcontractor to order what you want. You provide them with the models and the manufacturer and let them worry about the headache. Excellent. What's next? Uh, again, with material systems, material procurement. So if you're looking for particular windows that are gonna come from Italy, they're not gonna take three weeks. 
<laughs> they're they're going to take nine months. So understand the relationship between the material you're selecting and its availability, especially with all the volatility around the supply chain these days. Big box stores seem to have that under control now, and there's decent supply, at least in the Southern Ontario. Um, but if you're looking for something special, understand the relationship between when it's going to get to your door or the construction site and where it is in the world and what, you know, what timelines that uh, impacts and also cost, you know, you may not want to spend that much, but if you're going to get something specialty, understand that it's going to take a little bit more time to get that. Uh, another one is seasons. Do not underestimate starting a construction project, say in the winter time, if you have a tremendous amount of exterior work to do, like brickwork or any type of cladding. If you need to do brickwork in minus 20 weather, it's almost next to impossible to get that much heat in a tarped enclosure to actually brick it at the proper temperature. But it's going to add a tremendous amount of cost with scaffolding is not cheap. It has to be done properly or else it will create a lot of extra safety and health hazards on the job site. Um, if there's particular type of heating in there, then the tarps and closing it need to be fire retardant or else you're going to have a problem on your hands if one of them accident accidentally catches fire. Uh, and then the propane cost for the extra weeks or months, depending on how large your cladding system is that needs to be heated. So just be cognizant of the seasons and when you're starting the project sometimes the project starts in in april and you're not you know putting on the exterior cladding until the winter you may not have a choice but if you can at least foresee through us through a planned schedule and identify when that might happen you can at least maybe curtail some of it uh, as opposed to leaving it to you know We'll, we'll worry about it when we get to it. And then you have to drop the extra bucks. Uh, and then another item is, again, I've already kind of mentioned this, but it's just very important to leverage labor prices when possible, especially during uh, uh, the inflationary and higher interest rates we're having now. The residential market is sometimes hit harder than other sectors in the construction industry. And the trades are can be hungrier than usual. So you might be able to work out and negotiate some better prices and terms with your sub trades. So just be cognizant of that and get at least two or three prices per discipline per, per trade. So you can have at least a good, good idea of what the market is demanding for, for labor and material. Uh, and design and function. And what I mean by design and function is was just before you get to design and function, I just want to yes. highlight um, when it comes to labor pricing, and, and I see new investors make this mistake all the time. They go with the cheapest price. And the cheapest price isn't always the best price. Right. I, I remember when I was underpinning a house a few years ago in downtown Toronto, and I had pricing all the way from $7,000 to $80,000. For the same job, same scope. For the same job. Now the guys with the, for the $7,000 job, there were two guys in a rusty pickup truck with two shovels, right? Yes. I was gonna go with them, but but just make sure that the, the cheapest price is not always the best price. Not only the best, and the biggest thing is when comparing prices is to make sure that you are writing the scope out and providing all the trades with the same scope as opposed to letting them come up with a scope and interpreting what they're going to do. Then not only are all three prices going to be different, but they're going to be a different scope and you're not going to get the same, same output for each so, trade. So Lewis, let's assume that I am a brand new investor. I'm doing my first renovation. What do you mean by scope? Basically, the scope is going to represent the what's included in the price that the subtrade is giving you and the end result. Once they finish up and they're done their task, what are you left with? You're going to want to make sure that's the, the same result for all three trades. They're going to pour the exact same amount of concrete. Well, let's assume we're doing a bathroom, full gut bathroom right now. Can you and I walk through a scope right now? Uh, so, yeah, so quickly, a scope would include 
the type of material that's say you're going to give it to a general contractor and you're giving them everything to do. They're going to buy all the material, supply all the labor, start to finish. You're literally giving them a picture out of a magazine. This is what you want. Get it done for me. You're going to supply it to three different general contractors. And those three general contractors should be pricing the identical material because in a bathroom shower, for example, you can use at least four or five different backings for your tile. Are you, are you going to go with the Schluter system or are you just going to put up some regular half inch white drywall, which is not to code by the way, right? So who's, who's at the wheel here? So you have to have at least the, uh, full accountability on the specifications that you want the general contractor to build too, because that's going to create basically the playbook in which they move forward in this renovation. So you can give it to them and review it if you're confident in them and then maybe come back with some modifications or if you like one contractor's specification, you can uh, dictate it to the other two so they can adjust their price and, and basically follow suit as far as the estimation. But you really have to take, take control of it and provide them with the same type of material uh, finishes timelines as well. Some, some contractors can finish in three weeks. Others will take five. What does that look like from a cost perspective? So you want to give them time parameters as well. Tell them that within the specifications, not only material, but I want this done in four weeks. What's that going to look like in dollars? So they all have the same criteria to work off of. Got it. So uh, if we were doing a full gut reno on a bathroom, correct me if I'm wrong. I, I have a picture of a bathroom that I found on Pinterest or something like that. Yeah. You're my contractor. I give it to you. And I say, I want tile that's going to be this color. Yep. In, the, in this family color. Um, and I, I tell him what I can ask him. I can ask you then what type of backing is on that tile. Ex exactly. So you tell right. them you want a porcelain tile in this color with a Schluter backing. You want a curbless shower. So they're going to have to build it up with a waterproof membrane and you want a nice long three foot linear lineal drain. You want glass shower walls, you know, uh, white porcelain toilet and sink, whatever the case. So specific details of all the fixtures, what kind of paint do you want? You want mildew resistant in the bathroom, obviously something that's highly scrubbable and acceptable to humidity that's going to be developed in, in the shower. Uh, what kind of shower, uh, what kind of ceiling fan do you want? You want a nice Panasonic that's going to hum or you want some rust bucket that's going to get louder and louder. <laughs> so th these things are important. Yes, they are. Perfect. Thank you. No problem. Next. And, on yeah. So just quickly, I have uh, just two left design and function. What I mean behind that I guess can really apply to the larger projects. If you have any opportunity to add um, uh, accessibility requirements on a ground floor dwelling, if you can create, you know, if you're dealing with a small commercial unit that has some residential attached to it, do you have opportunity to put a pass through door and connect that small storefront commercial to the rear residential unit, uh, whereby creating a, a work live space? Um, it just might, create some better marketability in the end use instead of just having a, re uh, a rental space uh, like a two bedroom apartment, having that commercial component may increase the amount of people that are going to look at it now because, you know, the mom and pop needs a little place to live, but they also need a little commercial storefront to show their wares or run their business, whatever the case. So look at these things and see how you can kind of adapt some construction techniques to create more of a desirable product or product that can pivot with the market as well. And last but not least, schedule, plan and execute. So it's kind of a culmination of, of the first nine steps. Make sure you have everything in writing when you're reviewing things with your subs or your main general contractor, whichever way you go, uh, get a contract presented like Naran and I were discussing, make sure you have a complete scope of work for each sub trade. And then if you have a general co uh, contractor on site, what does the general contractor have to do above and beyond all the subs? How are they taking uh, accountability for the project? Are they taking care of the security as well? 
um, running the schedule for you? What kind, how active are you going to be as a client? Because if you don't have it on paper, uh, there's a good chance that that aspect of the project is going to land back on your shoulders because it's not stipulated in the contract. And then it's going to be an extra 10 grand here, 10 grand there, if you're lucky. Um, and if you need some help, get a professional involved. One thing that I've done in the past on personal projects, I have hired uh, retired uh, inspectors from the city and they love working for cash. So you can bring them in to critique a project and to see how things are moving along. And they'll bring some very important uh, things to light that you should be uh, knowledgeable about, but don't ever bring in someone for an inspection on a project and not tell the sub trade or the contractor. Don't blindside them or else that contractor will run the other way faster than they can drop their hammer and that'll create issues. So maybe put that in the contract that you're going to have third party inspections, just be transparent about whatever you want to do, but having a consultant part-time or full-time uh, is, is a huge help, especially if you're starting out, you're it's, you have to pay for it, but you're winning two ways you're learning and that's education that'll only help you in the future and it's going to help you reduce a lot of risk on that current project because you're going to have someone with you that has been doing it for a very long time. So that's that's it. I'm I'm done. That was a lot. <laughs> I tried How to cram it in. You enjoyed that. I've been in this business for years and I learned stuff, Lewis. There you go. So thank you very much. Um, if you have any questions or follow up, just throw it in the chat for me or just give Lewis some love if, if you found this helpful. The, uh, thank you very much, Lewis. And I, and I think that we at, at Rule, we could probably send out that list of 10 things in an email to, to our members who or to people that uh, are um, with us today. Why not? It's a good hit list to have. Yeah, it's a, it's a great hit list. Um, so so let's do that. Next, uh, Lewis, we have got our other partner in crime, Vincent Sundar. He's going to be coming in. Now, I just want to acknowledge that right now we are running about 10 minutes behind. So our meeting will probably go a little bit later than intended. And I know Tara's got a lot of stuff happening here. So this is going to be exciting. So we are going to go into... Alberta, Vincent, I'm going to hand the floor over to you, the stage to you, and you can take it from here. Sounds good. Um, well, thanks, Naran. Uh, thanks, Louis. That was that was awesome um, to learn all about construction, all the different phases. Um, but I'm equally excited to uh, now talk with Tara. Tara, how are you doing? I'm doing very well, very well. Excited to be here. Oh, awesome. Um, so we're going to chat about Alberta and investing in Alberta and all the great metrics. And uh, we're, we're, let me share a screen here. Let's bring it up and let's get going. Give me a second. Perfect. Do you see it? I do. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. So let's start with the rules of real estate investing in Alberta. So let's get right get into the first slide here. Pumping power. Let's talk about this. Yeah, so we've had record-breaking outputs of our crude oil since uh, the, since 2010. It's the most ever been put out, according to this graph. And I was when I saw this, I was really quite surprised because it's not something that hits the media very much. And this is even before we have the ex, uh, Trans Mountain Pipeline expansion. So. Um, definitely kind of explains a little bit too in what we're seeing in the market with this kind of uh, crude oil production. So it's, yeah, awesome. That's amazing. Um, just to see that, you, you know, the, in, it's media again, right? Where they're saying, hey, we're slowing down. We're not slowing down. There's, look, look at their production here uh, from 2010 to 2022. It's like tripled and it's just yeah. growing. Um, and it's just growing, yeah. And, and it leads into the next piece right here. Um, and this is the total migration and immigration into Alberta. Yeah, so again, record breaking in migration and migration into Alberta. I've been investing for over 10 years and I've been doing virtual walkthroughs with tenants for since the beginning. But this is the first year I've actually done virtual walkthroughs with people moving from in province 
for buying a house, like a $300,000, $400,000, $500,000 house that they've never seen before because they're just moving here. So it's definitely shown in these numbers and in, in the way that I'm transacting business as well. So so if you look at it right here in 1992, where it starts, look at the graph. It's it's like barely anything you see. And the migration, yeah, it peaks in like 2006, 2007, goes back down, peaks again. But we haven't seen this kind of records in in a long, long time. This is unreal. So the amount of migration and immigration coming from different provinces and out of the country, um, it's definitely attractive for Alberta. Um, and now we, we've only touched on it. We have only talked about oil so far, um, crude oil, but the other uh, different industries that we have going in Alberta, the tech sector, you name it, um, you know, hydrogen, which we're going to talk in a bit. Um, it's definitely attractive. So um, let's zero in a bit. Um, let's talk about Calgary. Now, Calgary's been hitting a lot of the news lately. So let's get into it. Yeah, so Calgary is definitely seeing an increase across the board. Uh, listings have fallen, which definitely helps with the basic laws of supply and demand. If you don't have a lot of the supply, um, it's helping increase their prices. But um, interest rates have caused buyers to go down a bracket. So as much as everything is going up, what could be a single family home, first time home buyers are now going to be buying like a row housing or something like that of that nature. So. Oh, wow. Um, Calgary's hot right now. Uh, anyone that's looking at investing Calgary, um, it's records. They're setting records like crazy right now. Uh, the amount of jobs being created in Calgary alone, it's, it's astounding. So um, if you're, if you're out of the province and you're looking at investing in Alberta, this is definitely Calgary is one of the spots to look at. Um, the only issue you're going to start to run into, just like Tara said, is supply. Uh, supply is running out, which is driving prices up. But the amount of jobs, the revitalization of downtown, like there's a lot of factors that's going to keep it growing year after year. The way we see it is, um, in, in talking from Alberta, uh, Calgary's following suit of Toronto and uh, Vancouver. So we do have a lot of high net worth uh, people coming from those two provinces into Alberta because cost of living is lower, taxes extremely low. I mean, we pay 5% GST, right? So we have no HST. Um, our, our province is very friendly when it comes to gas tax. We actually don't have any gas tax right now. They halted it. Um, so I think at the pump yesterday, we paid a dollar fifteen per liter. So which is very different, right? So um, that's something to definitely look at if you're looking at investing in Alberta, because we definitely are affordable. Uh, now we're going to bring it closer from Calgary, let's bring it closer to where I'm living in Edmonton, but it's Red Deer. Let's talk about Red Deer a bit. This one's interesting. I looked at the stats earlier. I'm like, hmm, there's a little different game being played in Calgary. I mean, Red Deer. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So there definitely is a decline in listings, but the purchase power, people are not really buying over 300,000. So given the average sale price, um, over 300,000 has really um, declined, it said, in, in their market stats. So. But what's interesting here, though, mm -hmm. is everyone's actually moving up a level. If you watch, the apartment average has gone down, but people are moving into row housing and semi-detached. So they're actually moving up a level, but they're also hitting the ceiling in Red Deer saying, hmm, I don't want that, you know, really single family homes. And, and they're coming down. So the bracket in Red Deer is really 150 to 300, which is really actually affordable. Uh, for many, especially with the interest rates. And if you look at the demographics in Red Deer as well, this actually plays really well. So Red Deer is actually doing really well. Now, um, I'm not sure if you heard, they're pulling a bullet train from Edmonton to Calgary with stops at EIA, which we'll talk about in Red Deer, I believe as well. And then obviously Calgary. Um, so there, there's definitely uh, in Red Deer and Calgary. So definitely this is a place to look at, especially affordability um, and just the proximity of where the next piece here coming up is now Edmonton. Uh, my, this is where we live. So uh, let's get right into it. What do you see here? Yeah, so definitely prices are going up. It's a supply issue for sure in Edmonton. Um, interest rates are, are affecting a lot of the buyers. So that they, again, can't go up to, you know, larger houses, row houses, semi-detached are definitely going to be where a lot of the supply is going to be needed. Um, but it's definitely a balanced market. So 
if you take out the last two years, it kind of actually still is on a trend with the last two years being a crazy outlier for being, you know, going up, but not at a crazy rate. So, and I love that you said that because, um, and, and this is historical, historically, um, we don't have the ebbs and flows uh, like um, Calgary does. We're very much steady growth and we continuously do that steady growth. So when you say balanced, there's nothing new there because definitely Edmonton is very balanced. Now what's interesting and what's changing the game. And here's, here's a piece that's coming up that a lot of people don't know. And I love that you brought it in. Um, let's talk about this uh, first, and then we'll get into stuff that people need to know. Yeah. So one of the biggest stre strengths of the Edmonton region is our people. So what most people don't know is we actually do have eight post-secondary institutions in our city, which brings in young and talented um, diverse age pool and talent. So um, it's definitely a, I didn't actually know we had eight, to be honest with you. I was quite surprised with that, that we had that much, but it definitely brings in a younger working population. Yeah. Um, we're also a hub for tech, uh, AI. I mean, DeepMind from Google um, head office was, uh, in Canada was actually here. Um, so we have a lot of uh, new tech um, and yeah, look at the GDP um, generation. So it's, it's definitely um, on its way now. This is the this is the piece that's a game changer, um, and people need to know that they actually don't really understand what it means. Our international airport. So, like, what's the big deal on this? And so, let's talk about that. Um, this is a great slide. You got to explain this one. Okay, so everybody has been, I'm sure, affected, but in some way by the supply chain shortfall. So, given how congested the Vancouver area and airport is. A lot of the Asian markets and different markets were looking at ways to get into North America. So the they've been going a lot into Prince Rupert because actually the Asian markets can actually save time getting into Prince Rupert. And the Edmonton International Airport seized that and became a one of the first connections inland from Prince Rupert. So we can catch that Asian market faster. So what does that mean, inland ports? So an inlet, so EIA made themselves an inland port. So what that means is the water ports are running out of land, right? So they are able to disperse their goods into an inland area through railway so that they can disperse their goods throughout the country at a faster rate. Okay, so what that means is this. Yeah, so YEG is actually Port Alberta. So it's actually designated as a free trade zone. So all of these goods coming in from Prince Rupert can take the railway to Edmonton and get manufactured tariff free. And because we have at Port Alberta, we have the Canmex Highway. So you can get your goods from Alaska to Mexico on the highway right next to the airport. And then, of course, we've got planes. So you can disperse it throughout North America with planes. And then we have railway, true. So we got planes, trains, and automobiles to disperse the goods throughout North America from Port Alberta. And another thing, because, you know, in Alberta, we've got a lot of land everywhere. We've um, just kind of went away so much from just oil and gas to actually agri-foods. So we are being able to disperse and manufacture food, so value-add food. So I don't know if everybody's familiar with HelloFresh, so you can like buy all the products and cook it at home. Well, HelloFresh is made and has their distribution center right in Leduc County. Um, there's a little potato company, same thing. So you can get the, all the potatoes in here and then they're going to, you know, uh, manufacture it and disperse it as well. So agriculture um, and value add agriculture is gonna be one of our specialties. So the key there is we've created a port itself inland in an EIA, in Edmonton International Airport that's tariff free. So. Um, the traction now is for all the Asian countries and, and people all over. Um, and the reason I say that is here's the industrial parks yeah. around so, the airport. Here's the airport A and here's the here's five different business parks. Let's talk about that. Okay. Yeah. So right around 
the airport again because they can manufacture and we've got a lot of land they're creating a lot of industrial parks so telford business park will be this lower i don't know can you see my mouse can you see mine no no nope. the lower the lower eye is telford business park right harvard business park is right above it north leduc business park is right above that if you go to the left so south of Devon has actually just rezoned 2,560 acres to be industrial park. That's over five Disneyland's worth of land. I can't even fathom. I've never been to Disneyland, but I can't even fathom. Like that's a lot of land. And then the very north one is Discovery Park. So the city of Edmonton has annexed quite a bit of land from Leduc County. Dis uh, that Discovery Park was the portion of all that land annex that was already zoned industrial park by the city of Leduc before it was annexed. So a lot, a lot of industry, a lot of jobs that are gonna be created around that airport to support the initiative of Port Alberta. So if you guys, um, if you guys recall, it's about going where um, we're going to be, where the industry is going to be, where the, where the whole market's trending. Um, if you look at all the different indicators, they always say, "Hey, look at LRT. Where's the LRT or train going to go?" Right? You know, buy around that, that those areas. Same thing here. If you look at what we've done, we've created a port around the port. We're now annexing all this land and creating all these business parks. Um, the main highway here, this highway two that goes all the way, this goes all the way up to Alaska. This goes all the way down to the States, right? And if you connect this way up here, it goes all the way to BC. Like either way you look at it, it's connected with rail, it's connected with road. Um, and now we're a huge hub for industrial, um, not just commercial, not just, um, uh, you know, flights, but commercial flights. Um all over so that's that's huge now how is this being managed this is this is why i'm saying this is important for us to know yes so this is actually my favorite part of the whole thing so <laughs> it's being managed by a private group of people business owners they it's called edmonton global so what all of the cities around edmonton is done Ladue concluded sherwood park they've all put their economic development dollars together and we're marketing it as a whole, Edmonton Global. So they're going around to all of these different trade shows and they're saying, hey, look at our region, come and pick us to bring your industry in. And depending on what the industry is, those communities can then, you know, put in and say, hey, I think they would be better suited for my area because of, right? Amazon was one of another one. We got that Amazon distribution center. So Amazon said, yes, okay, I like what you have. Where should I go? Ladue County won that bid. So that's right by, kind the of, right by the airport. Right. So then that's how their Edmonton Global is working that is they're bringing in all this investor money to look in and say, hey. And then from there, all of the communities can put their bids in and it's dispersed given the specialties of that area. So Sherwood Park got that hydrogen because they're more energy, right? So Sherwood Park area is getting a lot of that. Um, yeah, like hydrogen, what they're doing with hydrogen crazy. is just crazy. So, so I don't know if you know that that was announced. Um, I read it, I read it today, a whole community, um, it's sourced by hydrogen. So like a whole community, that's a new, and ACO is the one responsible for that. I used to work there. Um, so that's pretty exciting, um, that we're going to have a huge community just built on hydrogen. So, uh, and sourced there. Yeah. That's all part of the initiative. So if, if you are looking at to to invest in Alberta, I would definitely make sure that you check out Edmonton Global in regards to what initiative it has. Again, so it's not government funded, which is what I like about it. It's actually business owners saying, hey, this is what's going to drive our business. Let's band together and make it work. So um, another website, I think too, I'll put it in the chat is um, Major Projects Alberta. So it's a website, any project over $5 million they are tracking it. So you can actually see which communities are bringing in which funds, how much money, which projects are, um, so you can really, you know, take note of all the projects that are coming into Alberta as well for what area you want to invest in and what projects are interesting for you. Now a competitive advantage, I'm gonna take one more minute and Noran, I'm gonna hand it off to you, um, being cautious of time. Um, the fundamentals are there. 
our rents are, are, are lower here in, in Alberta. We don't have rent control. We don't. So that's, that's a major uh, benefit there as well. Um, the amount of properties we have for rent are like it's being reduced. Our values are going up, but they're affordable to purchase, especially for real estate investors. We have a lot of great investors here um, that are actually from Alberta on this call as well that I've noticed. So um, definitely attractive place, affordable. You could get into great multifamily right now as well. Multifamily is hot. That's another thing I've been watching. Um, there's some off market deals as well. So definitely um, it's, it's a time right now uh, to invest. Now, one thing to always remember, and this is as an Edmontonian, we always know this, Calgary is going nuts. We're always one year off of what Calgary does. So if Calgary is going nuts, we're just prepping and, and we'll be there again next year. So um, they, they could go crazy while we, we prepare and, and do it our way. So it's all good. But anyways, uh, I want to thank Tara. Tara, thank you for that lovely insight. Um, and, and she's definitely a trusted realtor with, uh, um, with Rule here, partner with Rule. Um, and I want to hand it off uh, to Naran. So Vincent, um, <clears throat> Tara, that was awesome. Vincent, thank you. Uh, I have a couple questions for you. Uh, the, the hydrogen increase in um, hydrogen production and in uh, the leveraging of hydrogen, what are they using hydrogen for? Is it for energy or is it for other things? Energy. Is it energy? Energy, yeah. We're going to be replacing uh, oil and gas there. So we'll be uh, using hydrogen. Um, so go ahead, Tara. Yeah, so, and I do believe, I think they're going to be looking at for hydrogen vehicles too in the future. So I think when I was talking to an electrician, having everybody plug in their cars is going to cause us to have a lot of issues within regards to how much power it's going to be able to draw. So they're really already looking at ways to next step because otherwise we're going to have to change so much with our electrical system. So um, hydrogen cars and all of that too. So, Okay. Uh, that's a real growing sector. Uh, there's um, uh, the science is growing in that area. The hydrogen originally and, and still is. The thing about hydrogen is that it's not just used in energy. It is also used to refine a lot of oil. So from, from an oil perspective, it is needed. It, it, it is used to create ammonia. Ammonia is what is used to create fertilizers, right? And with the increasing population and need for increased fruit, food production, fuel, fertilizer, those are things that are absolutely necessary. The other thing hydrogen is used for, if, I, if my memory serves me correctly, I could be wrong on this. It's been a while since, before, since I cracked open my chemistry. Uh, it's a cyclohexane, I believe, and methanol. Hey, now you lost me. <laughs> Both, they're, they're used in the creation of plastics oh, yeah. and in pharmaceuticals. So, uh, so uh, again, all... Well, the community, interesting, you said that. That community is actually being built right outside of our industrial area, which is oil refineries, um, uh, right beside Fort Saskatchewan, where we have a lot of plastics and whatnot being built. Uh, or utilize. So you're right. It's it's interesting you said that because it's right beside it, that whole hydrogen community. So, uh, there must be something there. so um, I have a question for Tara or and Vincent, you can probably answer seeing that you live there. I keep encountering investors in Ontario where I'm investing and they say this to me. They say, I want to invest in Alberta, but I can't figure out the property management there. Every time I talk to people, it's like a nightmare. What's the remedy? If I want to invest in, how can you, how can the property management issue be solved? Easy, you just, you, you gotta connect with the right people. So we have great property managers. Myself, for example, um, I actually have four different property managers, one for my commercial, um, and, and I have uh, three others for the residential, so homes and my condos. Um, I do have four and they're like, well, why don't you consolidate? Well, you know, there's a thing called competition that helps, right? So them knowing that, you know, they're not the only game, um, but you know what? They're, they're great at what they do. So why would I get rid of them, right? Why would I consolidate? And a bit of, you know, competitive, uh, you know, nature is not a bad thing, but there's some great people here. There's some folks I wouldn't recommend as well, just like anywhere, um, but it's just reaching out to people like in our rural community, we're here, 
I mean, there's Tara and myself, um, and there's folks in Calgary that we know, right? So um, we could definitely recommend folks. Uh, you just reach out to us. Okay. Property okay. management is not an issue out here. And you also touched on Tara. I, I think that you were talking when you when you spoke. You or there was this slide where you talked about the decrease in multifamily people living in apartment buildings, but the semis have gone up. Is that correct? Yeah. So people are still moving. They want to move up. They want to have that yard. So if you look at like the age bracket of the majority of the population in Alberta, it's you know, mid thirties. So they're starting to, you know, get families. They're starting to want that yard. And I think they're moving up. So the se the semi-detached, the row housing, that I think is going to be where a big supply is going to be needed to catch that in like that influx of people moving out of the apartments. It's still needed, but I think we just need to watch where we're growing and what supply we're growing. Or so it's being backfilled though. Sorry. It's being backfilled by migration, by the way. Um, so even newcomers coming in, so they're filling in a lot of those spots too. Um, I know Zoria on the call, um, she does a lot of those townhomes as well. And so, um, but it's, it's interesting how that trend's happening. So in the, the, I'm a multifamily investor. So I see that and I go, does this mean that multifamily prices are getting a little softer? And if it does, is there an opportunity for me to jump in? Um, it's a great time to buy. I could tell you that our multifamily prices are actually pretty low. I would say it, we haven't um, hit the big um, spikes yet, but we are going to. Um, multifamily is in demand right now. Um, so right now is a great time to buy. I wouldn't say it's soft. Um, I own and it's definitely not soft, but it hasn't hit that next boom and the and that boom's coming. Okay. Great well, time to thank, thank you very much. Um, so appreciate your um, your wisdom, Tara, and, and, the, and the way you show up. So thank you. Uh, if any of you want to connect with Tara, send uh, Vincent or info at Real Estate Wealth Lab uh, and we'll put you in touch. Awesome. Thank you. Perfect. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. Before I let you go, if you're a rule member, uh, you'll already know this, but I, I want to take maybe three minutes. And if you are visiting us for the first time or you're new to our community, i just walk you through some of the things that we offer. Vincent, if you could uh, throw that uh, slide up there for me and we'll go through this. And so uh, one of the things that we do as a value add service is that if you need coaching for a fee, we do provide it. We have people like Lewis, myself, Ken, uh, Wendy, uh, we're all, we're all uh, available to you. The, if you are a beginner, if you're looking at investing in real estate and you are a beginner, you're, you've got a couple properties under your belt, you're just starting off, highly, highly recommend. Join us. It's $49 a month. This gives you access to, uh, to the rule, to our community. But most importantly, it also gives you access to coaching uh, on a monthly basis. You get access to myself, to Lewis, to Vincent, where you can actually come in on the call, go, here's what I'm dealing with. Here's the problem. Here's where I'm stuck. And we will push you. Like Terry will tell you that, that we will ask questions that make you move. I, I, Terry, I'm picking on you because you're just right there on the right side of my screen. Okay. Um, next slide, please, Vince. The, uh, the, one of the things in our um, web, on our website is that you will find all kinds of information. It is actually almost like information overload. We had, if you are interested in doing investing in real estate by yourself, being an investor, learning how to do it, there's a DIY uh, playbook that you can walk through. If you are brand new and you're, you're you're thinking, man, I don't know what kind of deal I want to do, because there's a, we have a we have a uh, questionnaire for you to go through a quiz what type of deal hunter are you it, we have all kinds of stuff that when you go back into the office uh, into our member office what you're going to find is all kinds of information for you to sift through that will help you articulate what you are about and help you zone in on the area you want to focus in on okay the, uh, we also have access to different 
um, analysis spreadsheets that you can use. Uh, some of you are spreadsheet people. Like I, I love my Excel spreadsheet, but sharing my Excel spreadsheet with a partner is a disaster because it looks confusing. I understand it, but only I can understand it. By putting my stuff into something like um, uh, some of our templates, we're able to spit out stuff that looks professional, especially if you're starting out in the business. I, I find it can be really helpful. For if you are next level, so you are, you have, you're, you're looking to scale up, grow fast. You want it all. You want access to everything we've got. Nine nine dollars a month, and you can cancel anytime. I believe that is it. Uh, there is a 14-day free trial. If you scan that code, you can come in and, and join our group. Uh, the Our next meeting, I believe, is when? Could somebody throw that out for me? I believe it's in two weeks. Anyway, you'll get an email about it. The um, uh, Vincent, do you know when it is, or Annalisa? We may not have that on our event calendar. Ken's, Ken's not here. Ken knows this stuff by like the back of his hand. He's our operational dude. Uh, anyway, <clears throat> feel free to join us. Um, so thank you for joining us. I'm going to say goodbye at this point or, or good night to everybody because I want to be conscious of the time. Thank you so much. We're so grateful for you to spend Wednesday evening or afternoon, late afternoon, whatever time frame you're joining us on uh, with us. Um, but having said goodbye, um, I think it may be a good idea for about five or 10 minutes if we just open the mic and see if we have questions. Lewis, maybe we can get you on here as well. And we can just have a chat. If you want to stay, stay. If you want to go, go. Uh, perfectly cool. Any questions, anybody? Uh, March eight. Yeah, mm -hmm. so March 8th, we have a community mastermind. And then March 22nd, the rules of real estate investing. All right. March 8th. Thanks, Vincent. That is for our rule members. That's our community mastermind uh, with our coaching. All right. Um, so any questions or anything that you want to deal with? I have a question. Um, Who's that? I can't see you on my screen. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Can I Sorry, ask? sir. What's your name? Um, I have yeah, this have one. Oh, sorry. It's not showing up. Oh, it's showing up now. I see it. Popping it. up, yep. Oh, okay. Yep. Thanks, Alan. Yeah, no problem. I'll turn my video if you want. No, no, that, it's uh, up to you. But what's your question? Uh, basically, I have a rental property in Edmonton and uh, I hold it a little over five years now, but I am not seeing any appreciation anywhere, really, anything positive appreciation. So uh, maybe this is a question for Tara. Do you see there will be any appreciation because of this hydrogen thing or anything, replacement of oil and gas and in the property appreciation coming up in the future in Edmonton? Well, again, so I think basic laws of supply and demand state that if there isn't, uh, there's a lot of demand and not a lot of supply that property prices will increase. So I'm not really too sure about your specific property um, in regards to what community or you know, what asset class he's purchased, but um, just given the sheer number of people coming in and the fact that we can't build them fast enough, I really do think that um, it's going to affect our market. Like it's going to, uh, generally it's going to, the prices will be upwards in the coming future. I, I do believe, yeah. Right now, if I'm pricing a property, I'm pricing it at a balanced market. I'm not increasing given what the market has said for past sold. So if I'm listing a property, I'm kind of like, I'm, I'm not increasing it like I was last year. Last year, the price sold, let's just bump it up and sell it for more. I'm not doing that. I, I'm I'm listing at a balanced rate or at a balanced price, but. Um, yeah, so last year, um, even around the corner in Edmonton here, um, just a few blocks away, a single family home that was about 795 um, it increased all the way to 950 uh, and selling at 950. So it went up about 155,000. Uh, and that's just around the corner from me. Um, that was typical last year's prices. Now, since then, it's leveled off. Um, but then 
when I'm looking at it, I'm looking at what's happening in Calgary, what's happening, all the different projects. Um, definitely, uh, it's it's a time to hold on um, right now, um, especially with the migration coming in. So I wouldn't I wouldn't be selling myself. Um, I'm not looking at selling, um, but there is a, another increase coming in my mind. So um, there's definitely was an increase last year, and there there's going to be some more coming up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Anyone else? There was a question in the chat about 15 minute. Um, yes, um, I yeah. saw that and I didn't know what that meant. I meant, I'm sorry, I meant to bring that up. Oh, it's easy. Um, it means, oh, okay. I, yeah, so Terry, you want to talk about it or you want me to go? No, so you just, go. Bring, uh, just reframe the question for everybody because not everyone would have caught that in the chat. Sure, let me, let me bring it up here. Uh, give me a second. It was from Ron, I believe. Um, yeah, Ron Wall. There he goes. Concerned about the 15-minute city nonsense in Edmonton. That would be an economic killer um, comment. Depends what is you, that? So, so our city council um, has said, hey, we'd love to have all the amenities within 15 minutes of your home. So all the Home Depots, all the different grocery stores. Um, everything, right? Schools, all that stuff. So what you have is pockets of communities within Edmonton that you're 15 minutes away from everything you need. So um, some might see it as an economic killer. To me, it's actually the opposite. Um, but I guess it's how you perceive it. Um, to me, if there's something 15 minutes close to me and I'm living on the edge, like my house here, I could see the airport. Like there's farmland and then airports. So I'm right at the end. Um, to me, if there's anything 15 minutes close and that's how they want to build it, I'm, I'm all for it. So I okay. guess it depends. Great what, sense. Yeah, yeah. But, depends how you look at it. So Terry, your comments? No, so, and I, I'm in the same boat. Like time is all about travel. I don't want to be stuck in having to drive a half an hour if I don't have to. My time is money. Like I, I could just go right close and it's only 15 minutes away it it just makes more sense as livability too like i don't one thing that leduc is is missing is that we are not a walkable community we've really conglomerated our, our commercial in one area and if we could have a couple of strip malls in each of the communities i can send my kid five bucks to go get me milk i'd love that then i wouldn't you know like i don't know i i, I see it differently as well i think it's just a lifestyle a way to um, Absolutely. So, Doria asked in the chat, isn't most of uh, Calgary 15 minutes itself? It's Edmonton, actually. She's, Edmonton. she's here. And, and it's true. It's true. Everything, it's pretty much already here. Um, so, um, if, if, I, if I may, this is something that was brought up with the World Exchange Forum the last little time, the last thing. It's been around for quite sounds, some time. Sounds like and Maureen. You, is it Maureen? It is Maureen. It is hey. Maureen. Sorry. Um, the, these things have been around for quite some time. Uh, and if you look at the European cities, they are pretty much 15 minute cities and they, they understand that like you're going to, and they use New York as an example, but so New York's only going to have one theater district. So there's going to be pockets of specialties, but in general, all your essentials will be within 15 minutes. I might have to go, I'm using mine because I would love to sew. I might have to go to a sewing district to get that kind of stuff because it's not essential for the average individual. But what the average individual needs is supposed to be within the 15 minutes. And then you have the paranoid people and say, oh, sorry, and the better public transport so that you can get from point A to B. Then you have the paranoid people and say, no, that means that you can't leave your 15 minute radius. Yeah, yeah, yeah. no comment. Anyway, I've been Got having it. discussions about it. <laughs> So, so here's how my, Maureen, thank you for that. that uh, that's good. Great to hear your voice. The, um, my crazy mind, when I hear that, here's what I think. If we're having businesses being created or allowed to be within 15 minutes of areas, then the next question is these businesses have to be sustainable. In order to be sustainable, there has to be enough people living within 15 minutes of that area. In order to do that, you need to allow for development and um, intensification. Inten yes, that's the word I'm looking for. That is exactly the word, right? So on a long 
horizon, a long investment horizon, I think it makes great sense. How do they deal, Tara, with the medical? They want a hospital every 15 minutes? Like, how does that work? I don't think it was institutional like that. I really think it was just like a lifestyle thing. But densification is actually a mandate that the provincial government has given to the communities because they want to stop the urban sprawl and they want to save agriculture. So they want to diversify our economy and they want to make sure we're not so oil oil and gas dependent that actually they wanted to make sure that we are densifying our communities. So in Edmonton, some areas you can have three suites, garage suites, basement suites, some communities in Beaumont's too, you can do three suites on a plot of land because densification has actually been mandated for us to make sure that we are aware of our urban sprawl. That's, I can share that sentiment, Tara. I was actually downtown Toronto today at a little presentation by a world-renowned architect and he said, in particular in North America, we've done such a horrible job designing for the last hundred years that they really want to keep the large cities growing and they want to take away from different smaller smaller towns because essentially people are moving into the big cities where all the jobs are and all the essential services and and uh, everything else that we have so what they're looking to do is really redesign the way they build cities globally outside of north america in other uh, areas that are growing at tremendous rates faster than north america so it's very interesting because by 2060 our land masses as far as buildings being built is going to double globally so imagine that and a lot of this isn't going to happen in north america so just i wanted to throw that in throw that in there because very interesting if you uh if you take into perspective what's happening on a global scale north america is kind of on its on its own it's not not like other continents that have been developed for much longer time than than we have here. So we're, we're an experiment. I could definitely say that for sure. Yeah. Well, it is uh, edging up to nine o'clock. Unless there is another question that is pressing to be asked, I'll give it a second or two or three. Um, why don't we say good night? Thank you, everybody. Vincent, why don't you have the last word? Uh, you uh, know what? I want to thank uh, Jamil uh, for his comment on Bill 23 in Ontario that passed the uh, Homes Build, Build Better Act uh, for sure. Um, last word, love the segment today. It was, it was awesome. It was great to see the participation. Um, and, and Tara, thank you. And thank you, Louis, for uh, your uh, kind words and presentations as well. And very informative. And uh, can't wait until next time. Thank you. Thank you, Moran. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Moran. Thank, thank you, you Tara. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Have a great time, everyone. Thank you. See you, see you in two weeks.